organizations, it gives me great pleasure this evening to welcome our esteemed colleague and our dear friend, Dr. Adam Sabra. Dr. Sabra is here this week as our Bayer Dodge Distinguished Visiting Professor in Arabic Studies. He is Professor of History at the University of California at Santa Barbara and holds its King Abdelaziz ibn Saud Chair in Islamic Studies. Previously, Dr. Sabra has taught at both Georgia and Michigan universities in the United States. Many of you are probably familiar with Dr. Sabra's book on poverty and charity in medieval Islam, Mamluk, Egypt, 1250 to 1517, which was published in 2000 by Cambridge University Press and translated into Arabic in 2013. Since that book, which was based on his PhD dissertation at Princeton, Dr. Sabra has published on various topics with titles including Ibn Hazm's Literalism, a Critique of Islamic Legal Theory, From Artisan to Courtier, Sufism and Social Mobility in 15th Century Egypt, The Second Ottoman Conquest of Egypt, Rhetoric and Politics in 17th Century Egyptian Historiography, Charity and Hagiography, the Akhbar Abil Abbas al Sabti of Ibn Zayed al Tadili, and The Age of the Fathers, Gender and Spiritual Authority in Late Medieval Egypt. He has also edited with Richard McGregor The Development of Sufism in Mamluk, Egypt, published by IFAO in 2006, and has published a text edition with an introduction of Abdul Wahab al Sha'arani's Irshad al Mughaffaleen min al Fuqaha'i wal Fuqara' ila Shurut Suhbat al Umara and Mukhtasar Irshad al Mughaffaleen, both published by IFAO in 2013. In his first book on poverty and charity, and since then, much of Professor Sabra's research has focused on various aspects of late medieval and early modern Sufism, both its intellectual development as well as its social and political history, including the connections between its adherents and the powers that be. More recently, Dr. Sabra has been researching the early modern history of the Bakreya family in the Ottoman period, which is the subject of a monograph he is currently writing and which was the topic of his public lecture here on Sunday. In the context of that, he has published autogra uh, sort of, sorry, Autobiography and Family History in 17th Century Egypt, Ahmed ibn Zayn al Ayyabidin's Qala'id al Minan. Uh, and, and an edition of Monaco al Sad al Bakriya, which he prepared with Mustafa Mughazi, is due out this week by Dar al Mashriq in Lebanon. This evening, in his second public lecture, Dr. Sabra will discuss Sufism and political theory in the late Middle Ages. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Dr. Adam Sabra. <laughs> thank you, and thank you. Uh, Amina for that very kind and uh, detailed introduction uh, to my work. Um, Amina reminded me uh, in my first lecture that the first person to hold this uh, position, this visiting professorship, was my late father, uh, who passed away a year ago. So it's particularly poignant for me to be here now. Uh, and you know, I want to again thank my friends uh, here in AUC who were kind enough to invite me, uh, give me the opportunity to share my work uh, with them and with you. So today I'm going to speak about Sufism and political theory in the late Middle Ages. And as you've been told, I've done quite a bit of work uh, on al wahhab al-Sharani, 16th century Egyptian Sufi, with a particular emphasis on his works on politics and the relationship between Sufism and political power, between spiritual power and secular power, secular understood here in the sense of worldly power, not anti-religious power. And I was asked uh, to perhaps expand upon this topic in a, in a more larger historical framework. So I'm going to begin perhaps someplace that is not, uh, not perhaps obvious to all of you or perhaps not uh, immediately uh, connected to Egypt in the 16th century, which is I'm going to start uh, in the Maghreb and Al-Andalus uh, in the 12th century. Uh, some of you will perhaps know where this is going, but for those of you who don't, perhaps I can convince you that important aspects of Egypt's religious life originate actually in the Maghreb uh, over a period actually of some centuries, but I'm going to give a couple of specific examples to understand the development of Sufism and political thought in, in Egypt in the late Mamluk and early Ottoman period with that background. So uh, what I want to do is go back to the 12th century, uh, a period in which a number of figures with a messianic pretensions appeared uh, in the Maghreb and in Al-Andalus uh, during the late 
al muravid and early al muhad period, or Dawlat al muwahidin if, if you want to use the Arabic term. Uh, and the fact that many of the uh, oppositional figures to first to the al muravids and then figures who interacted with the al muhads who claimed to be imams, uh, came from a Sufi background. Uh, and that there are two famous cases, Ibn Arif and Ibn Barajan, who suffered persecution and, and ultimately were eliminated by Ali ibn Yusuf ibn Tashfin, the Almoravid ruler. Uh, and a third figure, uh, Ibn Qasi, who uh, arose from a local family in what is today Portugal, uh, between 1142 and 1151, who claimed to be an imam, in this case, something I understood, not simply a leader, a political leader, but perhaps a divinely inspired political leader, uh, perhaps with a background in Ghazali's uh, thought, something we can discuss perhaps in, in greater detail. Uh, he also claimed to be a Mahdi, something, someone who is rightly guided, sometimes understood to be a messianic figure, but sometimes simply a rightly guided or just ruler, and one who possessed Esma, right? Esma meaning that he was divinely protected from error. And this is obviously a theory we predominantly associate with Shiism. Although he was not a Shia in any way, shape, or form, nor did he claim descent from the Prophet's family. Uh, and unlike the other two figures, well, uh, Ibn Qasi was closely allied with the Almohads, but ultimately uh, he dealt also with his Christian neighbors. There was a period in which, uh, there was a period in which with the collapse of the Almoravids, uh, there was a period of uh, back and forth between Muslim and Christian powers in Al Andalus, and was ultimately killed by his own people uh, for those uh, for those dealings. Uh, so we have a number of figures in Al Andalus and in the Maghreb at this time who were claiming some kind of divinely inspired leadership, perhaps based in in Sufism. Another figure who was not immediately identifiable as a Sufi, although he also claimed a uh, connection to and Ghazali was Muhammad ibn Tumart, who died in 1130. Uh, he was born in the anti atlas in uh, what is today uh, Morocco between 1078 and 1081. Like many uh, scholars in the Maghrib, he traveled eastward in search of learning to make the Hajj uh, and for other reasons. Famously, it was alleged that he had met Al Ghazali, the great author of the revival of the religious sciences. Uh, you know, uh, and Munkath and Dalel, the autobiography, spiritual autobiography, uh, and other, many other works. This is, of course, not possible from the point of view of, uh, of dating. However, w he clearly had an identification with Ghazali, someone whose works had been burned under the Almoravids. And he met a fellow uh, Maghrebi in exile, a Tortushi in Alexandria. And Tortushi also had a connection, I think, uh, with, with Ghazali. Finally, he returned to the Maghrib in 11. 16 or 17, uh, and founded a movement, or da'wah, as it was called, dedicated to commanding right and forbidding wrong, which you would be familiar with the Quranic precept, the idea that Muslims must, in fact, uh, intervene in some way when they, uh, to ensure that Islamic law is followed and to prevent obvious violations of public moral and religious principle. Uh, and uh, although many ulama took the view that one should be circumspect about the use of this principle. Ibn Tumart's movement was in fact an activist movement, one that went from town to town, directly intervening in people's behavior. Uh, things like um, women mixing with men at weddings, or people not praying properly, uh, various other kinds of things. Uh, in, he arrived in Fez in 1120 and immediately set about des destroying the shops where people sold musical instruments, for example. Music he regarded as, as forbidden. Uh, so he was, in some ways, perhaps a rather dour figure. Uh, he opposed also what he saw as the anthropomorphism of the Almoravids, that the Almoravids, in his view, had a theology which uh, gave human characteristics to God. They saw God almost as a kind of human, as having a human sort of form, uh, at least in his interpretation. Uh, and he was someone who had very little tolerance for opposition. Uh, his opponents in the historiographical works of the, Amor, of the Amorhads are generally labeled as hypocrites or even apostates. Right. So, of course, if someone is a hypocrite or an apostate, particularly an apostate, that person can be fought and even killed. 
And in fact, the, uh, the Almohads were quite willing to do exactly that. There are cases, indeed, uh, more with his successors in which hundreds, perhaps thousands, uh, even of their own followers who were regarded of suspicious loyalty were executed for ideological, perhaps ideological or political deviations. In the year uh, 515, in the year uh, uh, perhaps of some significance, uh, of the Hijra, he was proclaimed imam either in Tinmal or uh, Iliz in, uh, in the Atlas Mountains, uh, and was regarded by his followers as the Mahdi, as the, the promised Messiah, uh, endowed with Esma, um, with infallibility, uh, as someone who combined fiqh, he saw himself as a faqih and mujtahid, independent of the existing schools of, 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 uh, of law, with a specific aqidah, specific religious doctrine, specific theology. Uh, he also acquired, either, either in his own life or, or shortly thereafter, a Hassanid lineage. And he claimed to be, or was claimed to be, descended from uh, Al-Hassan ibn Abi Talib, and Ali ibn Abi Talib. Uh, and this is something which, of course, had a long history in the Maghrib, going back to the Idrisids. But here it reemerges, in part because, of course, the Mahdi has to be, uh, has to be Muhammad ibn Abdullah, has to be from the Prophet's family, has to be a Hassanid, according to certain prophecies. So uh, he's trying to fulfill these. Uh, after his death, his followers, known as caliphs, uh, you know, Khalifa, perhaps an imitation, some people believe an imitation of the Fatimid approach, where the, the Mahdi was followed by a series of Khalifas, uh, undertook the conquest of the Maghreb and Al-Andalus, and Al-Andalus, creating what was the, at that time the most successful unified state in the area, and up to that time, since, certainly since the Arab conquest. Now, the doctrines that he was the Mahdi uh, and endowed with, with Isma were clearly controversial uh, among many people. Certainly the sort of more old-fashioned orthodox Maliki ulama didn't like these claims. Uh, and finally, uh, in 1230, uh, al Ma'mun, who was one of these caliphs, rejected, publicly rejected the doctrine of, of Isma as being heretical. Uh, and the Mahdi returned to simply being the founder of a dynasty. But up to this point, he'd been seen uh, in quite different light. Now, uh, it's into this environment that the next figure I want to talk about was, uh, was born. Uh, and that, as many of you will probably realize or expect, is Muhyiddin ibn al-Arabi, who was born in Murcia, southern Spain, uh, in 1165, the Common Era. So during the, the Almohad period, uh, he had close connections to the Almohad court, most likely. He seems to have fought in Almohad armies. Uh, in 1193, he visited uh, Tunis, his first trip to the east, what, what for him was the east, uh, to study with another sheikh, Sheikh al-Mahdawi. Uh, in 1197, he experienced a kind of spiritual ascension in Fez, which led to a book about the, the, the subject of spiritual ascension, a kind of Neoplatonic and Sufi uh, discussion of the, uh, of the notion of a spiritual ascension. And finally, in 1200 of the Common Era, he left Andalusia uh, for the or Andalus for, for the last time to go to the east. Again, as many uh, people did, perhaps to make the Hajj, but this was someone with uncommon spiritual ambitions and ideas. Uh, he went to Mecca, of course, uh, but then uh, after some time went to Malatya in eastern Anatolia in 1204, uh, where he remained uh, associated perhaps with the court of a Seljuk prince until in 1223 he went to Damascus, where he died in, uh, in 1240. Uh, and Damascus may have significance in that, as we'll see, it also is associated with various messianic uh, prophecies. His two major works uh, were in 1229, the Fasus al-Hikam, which is a one-volume summary of his system, a very complicated mystical system. Uh, and in 1231, the first draft of al Futuhat al makiyah the Meccan Illuminations, some people might say the Meccan Prophecies, uh, after which there was a second version completed perhaps in 1235. The version that we have in our hands today is the first version, the one that has been published since the 19th century. The second version apparently exists uh, in manuscript but has not yet been published. Now I want to talk in some detail about Ibn Arabi's approach uh, 
to politics, and we might call it a sort of cosmic approach to politics or to government, uh, one which influenced uh, Asharani and a whole series of other writers a variety of different political uh, and ideological points of view, including Sunnis, Shias, people explicitly Sufi, some perhaps not so explicitly Sufi, a whole wide range of people. Uh, we won't have time to talk about all of them this evening, but I am particularly would want to draw the connection between Ibn al-Arabi and al-Sha'arani. So uh, here I am going to really restrict myself to one book, which is the Futul Hat, already enormous work, but certain chapters that are relevant to our, uh, to our discussion. Uh, for example, in chapter 60, where he discusses uh, the governance of the supernal world, that is to the world which is, lies above the moon, right? so this involves basically the sun and the stars, uh, and the moon, sorry, the planets, and the, sorry, the sun, the planets, and the stars, uh, and the way in which it governs the sublunar world, that is to say the world below the moon, right, which is the physical world. Uh, and here he argues, drawing on astrological notions, that each of the supernal bodies, each of the uh, the stars, each of the planets, and so on, uh, has an angelic spirit or soul, which he describes or calls wulot, which of course wulot means governors, uh, officials, political leaders, if you will, but I think governors perhaps the best uh, translation. Uh, and that these correspond to the houses of the zodiac, uh, and that these wulot, these, 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 these uh, houses of the zodiac, then have deputies. Uh, in the seven heavens uh, and the stars. Now, the purpose of these governors is to carry out providence as it is written in the protected tablet, Aloha al Mahfuz. Uh, that is to say, to carry out God's pre eternal judgments or pre eternal, uh, the, the providence which, which, which God has predetermined, uh, and that angels then are sent down to bring prophecy and inspiration, uh, prophecy of course to the, to the prophets and the messengers, and inspiration to the, to the saints. Um, so already we have the idea, we have this astrological idea that the heavens in a sense control uh, the earthly world in which we live. He then moves in chapter 66 uh, to discuss the idea of the holy law, uh, Sharia, uh, but also the concept of Maslaha, but he uses maslaha in a very different way. We, we perhaps are familiar with the concept of maslaha in Islamic law to mean something like public interest. Right? This is often how modern Muslim reformers use the concept. For Ibn al-Arabi, maslaha was a, co was a cosmic concept. Basically, maslaha was what, kept, what keeps the world together. It creates a sort of coherent world which continues to exist. If it ceased to exist, if its order based on maslaha ceased to exist, the world would cease to exist. Another way to put it is that the afterlife would begin. Uh, and uh, so he takes this idea of, of maslaha and it turns into something, in some cases, approaching something like a, a sort of natural law. He talks about a siyasa hikmiya, that is to say, a, a, a kind of politic or a way of governing or a way of, uh, of living based on hekma, based on wisdom, which is universal. It's not specific to any law, it's not specific to any religion. You might, in fact, be an atheist and, instead, and still subscribe to a siyasa hekmiya. Uh, this idea is taken on later on by someone like Ibn Khaldun, by the way, to talk about uh, regimes that he saw pre-Islamic governments who he thought had no religious policy whatsoever, such as ancient Persia. He does argue that each, of, each siyasa hekmiya is specific to a specific region, that the, the climate of a given region means that what is, wa what is wise or what is good, it differs from one region to another. Uh, and he also describes this by another term, which is namus, right? Obviously from nomos, the Greek word for law, but here he means something like the cosmic order. This siyasa hekmeya, siyasa based on wisdom or based on cosmic principle or order, can then be juxtaposed to uh, siyaset nevawiya. And these are uh, policies or rules of governance or behavior that originate through prophecy. They can only be known through prophecy. They can't be known simply by the use of human wisdom, unlike uh, these, unlike this kind of hikmah approach. Uh, these also depend on time and place, uh, but they cannot be determined by, by another, by human, intervent, by human investigation. Now they exist obviously in the lives of the, the prophets, but after the prophets are gone, they continue to be 
uh, put forward by the saints, right, whose knowledge is, of course, derived from that of the prophets. And specifically, he says this to exclude the idea of the jurists being the people who are the uh, sources of our knowledge of prophecy, and launches an attack on the notion of taklid, right, the idea that the jurists deferred their uh, legal judgments to the opinions of the leaders of, or of members of their schools. Okay, uh, in another chapter, uh, 336, you may notice the threes and the sixes. He seems to be part of his, or, his system of organization. Uh, he talks about the idea that in every age there's a kutub, right, a, a, an axial saint, the head of the spiritual hierarchy, uh, who is parallel to uh, the head of the, of, the, of the physical hierarchy, that is to say, the ruler. Uh, and in some situations, the, the Khalifa Zahir is the same person as the Khalifa of Batin. An example of this would be Abu Bakr al-Siddiq, whom he presents as being uh, someone who combined both of these roles in a single person. But in most cases, these two people are different. The governor of the physical world, whose job it is, is to maintain social order, and make sure that, sh that Sharia is obeyed, is a different person from the Qutb. Uh, and they have a different sort of function. Uh, that in the sense that the Qutb is responsible for the soul, for the spirit, it's through, he, it's through him that the, uh, the prayers of all believers ascend to heaven and mercy descends uh, to the believers in response. And he says that uh, the Qutb the may choose to be hidden, he may choose for God to conceal him, uh, and in which case his deputy is the manifest imam, that is to say the, the secular ruler who is, who is visible. He also differs from the, the manifest ruler also diff, differs from the Qutb in the sense that the Qutb must always be uh, worthy spiritually of his post, whereas the, uh, the imam, on the other hand, may be personally fallible. Uh, he does not possess Isma in Ibn Arabi's system. Now, you can immediately, of course, see here, and I'm going to say in a moment, also that he is clearly contradicting in many respects the Almohad system while in some ways perhaps drawing upon it. Let me then go to chapter 366 of the Futuhat, uh, which deals with the, the viziers, the wazara, of uh, al Mahdi al Dahir. So there's a Mahdi who is manifest, right, uh, who governs, who brings the rule of justice to the world at the end of time. Uh, and this Khalifa will fill the earth with justice, where once it was filled with injustice. Uh, he will be Hassanid with the name of the Prophet, he'll be named Muhammad, uh, and he will resemble the Prophet. Then he goes through a long series of eschatological signs and events, which I won't go through the long list of, but they're famous ones, such as the conquest of Constantinople, which hadn't taken place yet, obviously. Uh, an epic battle on the field of Acre. Uh, the descent of Jesus to the white minaret east of Damascus. Uh, and all these are signs that the, of the coming of the Mahdi. Uh, and that when the Mahdi comes, he will remove all of the schools of law, and his enemies will be the people who follow taqlid, that is to say, the people who belong to these Sunni schools of law. Uh, he will be preceded by the seal of Mohammedan sainthood, right? this idea again that the saints are the, are the interpreters of the scripture until the coming of the Mahdi, uh, and that each of the saints is receiving his, his knowledge from a, through the uh, intervention of a certain prophet. And of course, Ibn al-Arabi is generally regarded as having been the seal of Mohammedan sainthood, the one who, who completed the seal, completed the, uh, the cycle of Mohammedan uh, sainthood. Um, so in this sense, basically, we have several things that, I and mean, that he will come in the seventh century of the Islamic era, which is say between 1203 and 1301 of the common era. Now, immediately this tells us several things. First of all, it tells us that Ibn Arabi is rejecting the authority of the, of the al Mahdi. Right. Um, he clearly is, is rejecting this. This is one reason perhaps why he had to leave uh, Al-Andalus and the Maghrib, that he was clearly opposed to the dominant political ideology of his time. Uh, it also suggests that in most cases he advocated a separation between spiritual and secular power, that the, the ruler, the caliph in a, in a secular sense, was not in most cases identical with the person who was the, uh, the Qutb, the head of the spiritual hierarchy. Although he allows for the possibility the two may be the same person, and Often his teachings are interpreted by later thinkers to mean that the Mahdi combined both kinds of authority in one person, that he was both a spiritual leader 
uh, and also a secular leader, that he would bring the reign of justice, uh, and, but also he would be divinely inspired. Uh, but he clearly doesn't think this person is going to live in his lifetime, uh, and he expects that person to come in, in the seventh century of the Islamic era. Okay. Let's fast forward now to the, the life of Abdul Habash Harani, who lived from 1493 to 1565, obviously well after the time prophesied by or predicted by, uh, uh, by Ibn al-Arabi, uh, by which point Ibn al-Arabi's ideas have become very widely accepted among Sufis, not uncontroversial certainly, but nonetheless very widely accepted among Sufis. Uh, let me first I'm going to do three things, really. First, I'm going to tell you a little bit about uh, Shah Rani's personal background and, and his life and times. And then I want to discuss the theoretical aspects of his political theory and his appropriation of Ibn al-Arabi's ideas, uh, uh, particularly how they relate to sort of common ideas in the 16th century in the Ottoman case. And then finally, I'm going to say something about two books he wrote about the application of these political and spiritual ideas. Okay. So Asharani was born in Kalkashanda and moved in his ch during his child to childhood to Sakhiyat Abishara, which is the origin of his name, obviously. Uh, his family claimed to come from the Maghrib. They claimed to be descended from uh, Muhammad ibn Hanafiya, which according to some interpretations would make him part of the Ahl Bayt, part of the Prophet's family. In 1505, uh, his father Ahmed dies, and he was brought to Cairo. Uh, by a local financial official who was a friend of the family. It was obviously a religious family that already had connections uh, to the Azhar and to the religious elite in, in Cairo. Once he arrived in Cairo, uh, he stayed in the mosque of Abul Hassan al Ghamli, uh, and there he became friends with a man named Nuruddin Shuni, who died in 1537 for 1538. And Shuni was an important figure in uh, Shah Rani's life and also in the religious life of Cairo in general. Uh, he's the one who was credited with beginning the uh, Mahya prayer in honor of the Prophet, uh, which spread from Cairo throughout uh, the Ottoman Empire. Uh, and uh, when ultimately when Shah Rani later died, he was buried next to Ashuni. If you've been to Shah Rani's grave, you know he's buried right next to Ashuni. Now, uh, in terms of Tariqas, which by this point had become quite widespread in Egypt, he's associated, generally speaking, with two, off with two Tariqas. Uh, one, of course, is the, the, that of Sayyid al-Badawi, Sayyid Ahmed al-Badawi, uh, and the other of Abul Hassan al-Shadili. And as many of you probably will know, these are opposite ends of the social uh, spectrum. Uh, Sayyid al-Badawi's order obviously associated particularly with rural areas and with relatively less educated people for the most part in this period. And Mashar is often very critical of uh, the, the followers of Ahmadis, as he calls them, for being uh, not following Sharia fully. Uh, the Shadalis, on the other hand, uh, by this point were very much entrenched in the ulama, amongst the upper ulama. Uh, last time I talked a bit about the Sadat al Bafa'iyya, Sadat al Bakriya, numerous other families who associated with the Shadaliyya. Uh, and so they, they tended to be much better educated. They had a much more positive attitude towards political power and towards wealth. Perhaps the most important figure in his life was a man named Ali al Khawas. Uh, who died in 1532. Ali al Khawas seems to have come from a, perhaps an Ahmadi background. He was, according to a Shahrani, illiterate. But a Shahrani treats him as an almost, uh, I wouldn't quite say infallible, but authoritative interpreter of the teachings of Ibn al Arabi, which is a, a curious thing. I mean, you think of Ibn al Arabi as one of the most difficult, learned writers of the Islamic tradition, yet for a Shahrani, the most significant interpreter that he knew of these teachings was a man who, who, who was, he says, is illiterate. And he says would speak in what he calls a Syriac tongue, that is to say he, that his, his language was often incomprehensible uh, to, uh, to his followers. And that uh, in, in Asharani's many works, he, most of his works are made up to a large degree of quotations of authorities. And Ali al-Khawas is perhaps the most important of those authorities, uh, in which he says that he actually says, translates Ali al-Khawas's ideas into a kind of a more comprehensible Arabic. This, of course, leads us to questions about whether we, really, we are reading a Shah Rani, Ali al Khawas, or some combination of the two. But it's interesting that someone of Shah Rani's learning, which was quite substantial, would openly and unapologetically place such authority in an illiterate figure. Of course, there's a, an obvious kind of parallel here with the Prophet Muhammad himself, right, being illiterate. And he says quite clearly that people like Ali al Khawas and a series of other saints he identifies receive their knowledge directly from the Prophet through inspiration. 
So this is a this is a combination then I think between a very literate and uh, uh, sort of a, and, and uh, elite Sufism with one that is in fact very much the, the Sufism of a non-literate and, and perhaps spiritual elite but nonetheless not socially elite, elite group of people. Many of them actually artisans. Uh, Al was someone who had a shop, lived from it, the, the, basically the things he did with his own hands, um, and the Shadali were very much also in the artisan and merchant uh, mercantile. Uh, elite, they were very much uh, sort of respected there. Now, uh, he, Shahrani, that is, att attracted the support of a number of different figures uh, in the elite of the uh, now, by now, the early, autumn, early Ottoman elite. Um, 1524, his Zawiyah was endowed by uh, Abdul Qadr al uh, And of course, having a Zawiyah then made him the leader of a spiritual community because the Alqaf allowed him then. Uh, to have disciples, to pay for them and their families, to uh, give charity to the poor. There were a whole series of ways in which he could function as a kind of spiritual and, and even perhaps political leader on a small scale. Uh, this is a time in which there was great, uh, great political tumult in Egypt. Uh, this is the revolt of someone named Ahmed the traitor, as he's known in historiography. Uh, Ahmed the traitor was a member of Sultan Selim's household. Sultan Selim, of course, had conquered Egypt in 1517 from the Ottomans. Uh, who was unhappy that he'd been passed over for the Grand Viserate, and so he launched basically a rebellion against the Ottomans, uh, attempting basically to perhaps reconstruct the Ottoman, sort of reconstruct the Mamluk Sultanate under his own leadership. Uh, and this was, uh, a, this was a very serious rebellion, went on for about two years, and it had to be re uh, repressed by force. Uh, Suleiman, uh, uh, Sultan Suleiman sent his favorite Ibrahim Pasha uh, to uh, and the revolt, and uh, everyone basically in the Egyptian elite had to take sides. It wasn't initially clear who would win. Now, Shaharani tells us very clearly that he took the side of the Ottoman authorities against Ahmed mm -hmm. the traitor. Given how things turned out, that would be a wise choice. Unfortunately, however, nothing that Shaharani wrote begins, it, it was written prior to the repression of the revolt. In fact, he begins to write just as the revolt is repressed, which I think is probably indicative of something. So he's telling us in a sense that I was on the right side. And in fact, he claims to have hidden Ottoman officials who were hiding from the rebels uh, in his Zawiya. Uh, so this, whether it was true or not, this uh, apparent loyalty to the Ottoman authorities allowed him also to then become a, a highly significant figure uh, with, with the Ottomans. He became friends with a number of Ottoman governors of Egypt on a personal level. He tells you quite a bit about this in his works. Uh, in 1551, 1552, there was a teftish, or an inquest, uh, into the Alkaf in Egypt under Ali Pasha, the governor. And uh, these, this basically dealt with the fact that many of the Alkaf in Egypt had been founded by Mamluks and their families after the conquest as a way of preserving their property from, from being confiscated by the new regime. Uh, and Shah Rani assures, him, uh, assures the reader that he sent all the documents to Ali Pasha and said, if there's anything wrong here, please take it away. I don't want anything that's illegitimate. Naturally, of course, Ali Pasha sent it back and said, you're fine. Um, but it was a very clear kind of sense that he had a, a good relationship with the authorities. The authorities were not about to confiscate the endowments of his, of his Zawiya. Uh, okay. Um, he also uh, was... Uh, was friends with a number of political leaders uh, in Egypt at the time, such as Jenem Bey al-Hamzawi, who was one of the most important figures in repressing the rebellion, but who later was executed by the Ottomans, as often happened to people who fell out of his favor, uh, and with the Beni Baghdad and Beni Omar. The Beni Baghdad were a family that were, they were tribal leaders, but also the hereditary governors of uh, El Munafiya, and the Beni Omar, a similar position, but in Upper Egypt. And although uh, they were suspected or actually did participate in the rebellion, the Ottomans only, published, only punished the individuals responsible. They kept the families in place. And in fact, in 1525, when the Kanun Ame was set down, setting down the administrative system for Egypt under the Ottomans thereafter, both families were specifically given hereditary control over the provinces by the Ottomans, suggesting that even their rebellion didn't stop them from being uh, uh, taken into the Ottoman system. Okay, so with that background, and obviously we're talking about someone who was politically highly uh, connected and involved in some of the most important events of his time, let me now ad address his appropriation of Ibn al-Arabi's political theory. And here I'm particularly going to talk about a book he wrote called Al-Yawakit wal-Jawahir fi Bayan al-Qa'id al-Qabir, 
which is a book on theology uh, combining Ilm al-Kalam with Sufism. So Ilm al-Kalam basically is Islamic theology uh, carried out, in this case, in a more Asharite manner, which was considered the predominant form in the Azhar at that time and it still is today. Uh, and an attempt basically to reconcile Asharism with Ibn Arabi's system, something which many people would say is pretty much impossible, but he makes an attempt to do so. Uh, so you have, basically what he does is, he, something that's actually quite useful for the modern reader, is he goes through Ibn Arabi's Futuhat and identifies the relevant passages on subject matters and then rearranges them by topic. So if you've read Ibn Arabi's Futuhat, you know very well that he, he distributes the information on specific topics throughout the work. And so you have to read through the entire work to identify the relevant passages, as I did, for example, a moment ago with the political passages. Uh, so here we have someone who's actually gone through, collected them, put them all in one place. By topics, actually quite useful. And if you go to the section where he discusses the idea of the two caliphates, the two caliphas, uh, he, he has an interpretation of uh, Ibn Arabi's theory uh, which again emphasizes very much this distinction between what he calls uh, Sultan Zahir and Sultan Batin. Right, so manifest power or authority and hidden uh, authority, which he understands as the rule of the body, the rule over the body in the physical world, uh, as opposed to the rule over the soul, divided between these two authorities. Uh, and again, Nawamis against Sharia. Uh, and this broadly speaking could be seen as a discussion of order versus salvation that manifest power is about maintaining order in society and Sharia in that sort of function. But not just Sharia, also secular authority. Uh, whereas uh, salvation and the concern with the soul, this is specific to Sharia. And he says, in this sense, Sharia is uh, superior to Namus, to secular law, because in addition to providing for a physical order, it also provides for the possibility of salvation, something you can't get from, uh, from, from a secular order. Now, um, this leads us to another problem, one that was very important in the 16th century, increasingly, uh, and that is the problem of kanun. Kanun is the term used by the Ottomans uh, for legislation uh, or rules uh, promulgated by the sultans, uh, particularly since the reign of Mehmed II in the middle of the 15th century. And we saw that Egypt, like other provinces, once it was conquered, they established a kanun a book of kanun, which was to govern the province thereafter. Now, there was a significant debate amongst Ottoman uh, legal authorities about whether Kanun was in fact a violation of Sharia, whether in fact it, it was an opposition to Sharia, and whether in fact one could accept it. Um, and particularly we see by the late 16th century, lots of thinkers saying, you know, the Ottoman Empire has gone astray, it has to return to Sharia, all this Kanun stuff. It's, it's, it's a secular law, and the, the, uh, the sultans should not have the authority to, to make these kind of laws. Now, uh, Sharani's take on this is, I think, a kind of compromise, uh, which is that he says that it's not permissible to use kanun in any place where there is sharia. Right? So certainly it would seem like in any Islamic country, or for that matter, a Christian or Jewish country, you could not use kanun because you have some kind of sharia, and sharia always, is always the, uh, the law which takes precedence. But he says, in the 10th century of the Islamic era, we're now living through something which is like Ayam al-Fatarat. Ayam al-Fatarat are the periods between prophets in which there's no access to Sharia. Now, this, of course, plays into uh, millenarian ideas, the idea that a Mahdi will come at the, uh, the end of the year, at the year 1000 or shortly thereafter. And uh, uh, one gets the sense that Ibn Arabi, oh, sorry, that uh, Sharani believes in this. Uh, and he sees basically, therefore, that we're living in a sense of the end, in the, in the end of the world at least in the form which we know it. Uh, and that under those circumstances, he says, there's no point really in trying to force people to adhere to Sharia. There's no point in expecting uh, Sufi saints to function in the way that the Sufi saints have all behaved. Because, in fact, this is no longer possible. Uh, in this era of uh, the decline of the world, the end of the world, uh, we can't, this is not possible. So under those circumstances, we can accept kanun, we can accept sultanic legislation, because it provides a necessary order until such time as the Mahdi arrives, until the coming of the Mahdi. And it's clear he does not expect to live to see the Mahdi. He's going to die well before the year uh, 1000 of the Hijra. But he accepts the idea, therefore, of Kanun as, an, as a necessary evil in this time. Um, he also argues that in this era, the Qutb, right, who is the source of mercy 
the person to whom prayers ascend to heaven and from whom mercy descends to man, uh, his power is on the decline. And he's uh, unable, in a sense, to intervene uh, in these situations. Uh, he says this will end with the rule of the Mahdi, who will combine the two Khilafas. Uh, and he also refers to Abu Bakr, he also combined, refers a lot, actually, to King David as a case of someone who's both a prophet and a king. Uh, and during the reign of the Mahdi, he expects, that, again, drawing in Arabi, the end of the rule of Taqlid. What's interesting, though, is that, as you probably will know, Sharani is perhaps most famous for having written a book on law. Uh, and uh, Al-Mizan al-Kubra, which is also a uh, shorter version of Al-Mizan al-Khidriya, right, which he claims to recede from Khidr, you know, th this eternal uh, saintly figure, if we want to use the expression of prophet, pr prophet, prophetic figure, who's usually associated with the Qutub and Ibn Arabi system. Uh, and it's clear that he, reg he says that Al-Mizan al-Kubra, this is the legal system that will be followed by the Mahdi. He's, he's telling me what the Mahdi will do. Okay. Now, let's look at that from the point of view of what's going, else going on in the 16th century. Well, there's a whole sort of uh, tradition based really on the Timur, it's the, there's the descendants of Timur, Tamerlane, uh, in Iran, Anatolia, and to some degree in northern India, uh, of emphasizing the idea of the ruler as potentially the Mahdi, as a messianic figure. Uh, and this idea is taken on uh, by the Ottomans, uh, or by some figures in the, co the court of Sultan Suleiman the Magnificent. If you want to read about the sort of further, er further, part further east, I would say Asfar Moin's book, The Millennial Sovereign, is a good introduction there. But uh, as Cornell Fleischer has demonstrated, uh, Suleiman was, was presented both as the Sultan, as the secular ruler, but also uh, during Ibrahim Pasha's in period of influence as the Qutb. And that meant that he was potentially the Mahdi, that he was in fact the Messiah. Uh, and this was based in part on his extraordinary record of conquest, um, which again could be seen as a sign of the Matthew's rule. Even the fact that he was legislated, that he issued kanuns, could be seen in a sense as the Matthew acting as a lawgiver. Uh, now, this came to an end in 1536 when Ibrahim Pasha fell from, uh, from grace and in the court and was executed. But it clearly was known, Egypt, Egyptian Sufis knew about it. We find it into the 17th century, Egyptian Sufis referring to this idea. Uh, and in this sense, I think we can take Shaharani's approach as a critique of the court theory. That what he's saying is that the, the Sultan should never be regarded, in fact, as, uh, or should not be regarded as, uh, the, the, as the Mahdi or as the uh, head of the spiritual hierarchy. He simply is the head of the, uh, of the political hierarchy. Uh, and uh, we have intimations that Shaharani regarded himself as the Qutb. There's a story where he has a dream he says, every night I have a dream where I circle the planet going from one people to another, bringing them mercy. This is a fairly sort of clear, uh, not very subtle hint that he regards himself as, uh, as the Qutb. Okay. Um, now before I go to briefly talk about these two books uh, on, uh, on political theory and relationship relationship between spiritual and, and uh, political authority, let me refer just to one more element of Ottoman political theory that's important here, and that is the circle of justice. The circle of justice is the idea that the, uh, the ruler depends on the army and on uh, the bureaucracy to maintain his rule. This then requires taxation. Taxation then requires production by the peasants and the artisans. And so a good ruler, a just ruler, intervenes to make sure that ordinary people, the raya, the, the flock, in this case the, the peasants and the artisans, are treated fairly by his subordinates. So it has, an, it has the idea, first of all, justice is related to the perpetuation of the dynasty. An unjust ruler will fall from power because this will undermine his taxation and, and uh, authority. Uh, and also uh, that the, the function of the ruler is to intervene to correct his subordinates. OK, so I'm going to come back to that in a minute. So as I mentioned uh, earlier, um, Ashan Rani wrote two books uh, about uh, the relationship between Sufis and politicians. Right? Uh, one is called Irshad al Muwafaneen min al Fuqaha wa Fuqara ila Shurut Sohbat al Amara, or the guidebook uh, for naive, uh, perhaps naive, jurists and mendicants to the conditions of befriending emirs. Uh, and then he wrote another book, which he called that in the Mukhtasar, the abbreviated version of that book. The first was done in 1544. 
the last done in 1562, uh, shortly within a year or two of his death. Uh, and the purpose of these books was to, first of all, to advise Sufis on how to deal with emirs in a variety of circumstances, uh, but also to, to advise the emirs on how the correct etiquette for dealing with Sufis. So he takes it for granted that Sufis are powerful people, politically speaking, that they have influence over emirs. The emirs treat them as spiritual advisors on a personal level, but also that they have the power of shafa, both in a spiritual and also in a political sense. Right? He makes a very clear kind of parallel. Right? Both the idea that the, spirit, that the reason that the emir wants the Sufi to be his friend is because when the day of judgment comes and the emir faces the inevitable consequences of his worldly behavior, that the Sufi will take him by the hand and lead him across the Sirat, across you know, the bridge across the hell, to, to help him obtain his salvation. Uh, at the same time, uh, because he has this kind of influence, many people will take the view that the, uh, the Sufi Sheikh is a good person to turn to to get intervention for political problems. What happens if the Emir's uh, followers are overtaxing you, if they're beating you up, if they're taking your goods? Uh, all the various kinds of problems that can occur. So uh, it's a very clear parallel here between the spiritual and the uh, political roles of the, uh, of the Sufis. And he says that this is intended for what he calls the active scholars, which is again a concept that has a longer tradition going back to Ibn Arabi, and the active scholars are those scholars who act on their knowledge. Right? And he seems to interpret this in a sense that one should be socially and politically active. Not all Sufis, of course, many Sufis rejected the whole notion of political activity. For them, Sufism was about the re rejection of the material world, including political and social prominence. Although uh, Shahrani often talks about the necessity for zuhud, for asceticism, or for denying oneself access to the world, he usually understands this as something zuhud will give you, being a, a, an ascetic, being someone who denies oneself worldly things, gives you a certain special status, which is you become like a, 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 an arbiter. You're a person to, to whom people turn to settle their disputes. Because you have denied yourself the world, you're therefore seen as impartial. So in fact, in this case, Zuhud doesn't make you unworldly. It makes you, in fact, an authority in the world. Mm. Your rejection of worldly things makes you exactly the sort of person either people want to turn to. Uh, he thinks of suhba, a friendship, as a relationship that resembles a contract. He talks about it particularly in terms of the idea that when you enter into a friendship with an emir, set down conditions, <laughs> and if either party breaks the conditions, the friendship is, 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 is broken. It's it, it, a contract. It becomes in, in, invalid. Right? So conditions like, don't send me all the food and the money and things that you've gotten by beating up the peasants, for example. Because if you do that, then this, this material will have a polluting effect on my soul. And then I won't be able to pray for you, intercede for you, and then you'll waste, a, you know, you, you've ruined me and ruined yourself. Right. So it's, it's, it's a bad deal for both of us. Um, all of this, of course, implies that people are regularly, in fact, sending the Sufis all kinds of good stuff. Mm -hmm. right. uh, go, you know, inviting them to weddings. He talks about Sufis inviting emirs to their weddings. The emirs show up, of course, with all the goodies, you know, to pay for the guests, to provide them with food and other, other goods, so, and, and gifts and so on. So it, it, there's a, obviously a close relationship here. That he that he uh, that he understands as, as existing. Um, another sort of problem here is that of partisanship, what he calls asabiya, but he doesn't mean it in the Ibn Khaldun sense of sort of ethnic partisanship. He means it rather in the sense that uh, the relationship between the Sufi and the Emir creates a kind of close personal relationship, and therefore the Emir will then ask the Sufi to intervene on his behalf, either by talking to important people or by asking God to punish his enemies or to deprive them of their posts so he can replace them. So again, he has to, you have to avoid that. You can't be seen as being partisan. Okay? Um, he says it's a unique relationship that each emir must choose only one Sufi sheikh. You, you can only have atakar, you can only have faith in one person to be your, your effectively your savior, really. Um, the person who will intercede for you with the prophet who will intercede, of course, intercede with, for Muslims with, with God. So it's a unique relationship. The minute you lack, you have, you lack faith in your sheikh, this becomes basically an, an invalid relationship, and you have to find somebody else. Uh, now, there's also, this also creates a notion of dependence, and he says, okay, actually, it, it is the emir who is dependent on the sheikh. 
He's dependent on him spiritually, and he must always also be dependent on him. It may never be, become, it may never be the case that the sheikh becomes dependent for material things or any other way on, uh, on, the, uh, on the emir. And he sees this very much in gendered language. He sees the sheikh as the father. Uh, the emir is a son or maybe even a wife. Mm -hmm. um, he uses, I mean, or, or he, you know, he uses this kind of language to describe the relationship. Um, that it, uh, the sheikh is very much a father, and anyone who is dependent on the sheikh could be seen either as a child or as a woman, because in, in Ashaarani's view, women and children are dependent on their, their menfolk. Right? Uh, he also warns very carefully against usurping the sultan's authority, and he gives several examples of Sufis who we knew who became so popular that they ended up being exiled or otherwise punished because they uh, had followers in the army or in the bureaucracy. And of course, one has to remember that the, the principal enemy of the Ottomans in this period was the Safavid dynasty in Iran, who were Shays, but who had a very strong Sufi kind of connection with their mm -hmm. followers. And so Sufism could be a means towards political power. The same thing was true to some degree, uh, we could see also in the Maghrib under the Saadi dynasty as well. So su Sufism was potentially a threat from, from the Ottoman point of view. And he's saying, you have to be very careful. Your popularity can lead you to uh, considerable downfall. Um, now, he also uh, was very much, unlike say Ibn Tumar, very much against the idea of publicly commanding right and forbidding wrong. First of all, he said there's no point. Okay. There's no point. We're living in an era in which uh, the world is coming to an end and therefore most of the problems of the world cannot be risked, cannot in fact be fixed. But also, when you do this, you are in danger of undermining the, the authorities. Right? By publicly re rebuking an emir or the sultan, you are undermining that person's authority. Furthermore, the person will then become embarrassed and be un unwilling to address the problem. So he says you should be very tactful, you should speak to them privately, you should give them sort of tactful advice, but again, he, effectively he's trying to go around the idea of commanding right and forbidding wrong. So uh, it's very much the idea of a, a close personal relationship between this, the sheikh and uh, the uh, uh, and the emir, but not the idea of a, of a public correction of the political authorities. Okay, let me then conclude by sort of trying to give a sense of what this all means in terms of the examples that I've, that I've given earlier. Uh, first of all, Asharani clearly drops certain aspects of Ibn Arabi's theory. Astrology, gone. <laughs> Doesn't even mention it. It's like it's not even there. Um, messianism, present, but in the future. And clearly he's very uncomfortable comfortable with the, uh, the idea that uh, contemporary rulers could be regarded as messianic figures. He clearly has the, the idea that each figure, this, the spiritual leader and the political leader, has his own role, and that neither side should cross the boundary with the others, to the other side's uh, responsibilities. Okay? Uh, and so much, much, I think really, really what this, these two books are about are primarily saying, here is a line which you, neither side should cross. Each side should play its proper role without uh, finding itself trying to play the role of the other. The, the spiritual authorities should not intervene in worldly affairs except privately to try to have justice done or mercy brought about. Uh, and the political authorities should not intervene in spiritual affairs. They should leave that to the, the Sufi sheikhs. Uh, uh, you know, finally, uh, the last point I wanted to get to, let me see what was that. Um, I've forgotten it. Um, yeah, so basically we could, we could sort of conclude that uh, Asharani is, is interested in basically maintaining this kind of distinction and preventing its, 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 its line of from, from being crossed. Okay, maybe we should... Uh, yeah, thank, you. Okay. thank you very much uh, for this uh, wonderful overview of uh, Asharani's uh, political theory and how the ideas of Ibn Arabi traveled in time and, and, and space. And uh, perhaps we have uh, quite some time for questions and answers if any of you... Uh, would like to pose any questions, please? Okay, let me ask one. So on the one hand, Sharani's theory appears to be uh, quite oppositional. Yes. And at the, on the other hand, he is also quite close to those in authorities. How, how do you think he managed to do that? Write some things that appear oppositional to what official political theory seems to have been or what the Ottoman Sultanate in, in the center, at least in Istanbul, was propagating 
and at the same time in the province or in Egypt where he was living to maintain good relations with the Ottoman governors there and the representatives there? Yeah. It's a good question. Um, one thing I should emphasize is that the, the theory of Suleiman as the Mahdi really only lasted until 1536 and so by the time he wrote uh, in 1844 the theory was on its way out uh, when Ibrahim Fasha fell. Uh, and the Ottomans began to shift towards a more law-based sort of system of government. So in that sense, he was not directly sort of contradicting them, but clearly he was implying, I think there's an implied, an implied sort of criticism of that theory. Um, again, at the appropriate time, mm. right? Mm. I mean, part, part of this is we have to see that, like any good politician, timing was everything for Shah Rani, mm -hmm. and he understood when you could criticize certain ideas, when perhaps it was best to keep one's mouth mm. shut. Uh, Part of it, I think, is that he did enjoy a certain kind of position uh, within Egyptian society. You know, the descriptions we have him now is a description of his funeral, uh, that it was the largest funeral of his age. Uh, and he was, so he's someone who, uh, the Ottomans, I think, would have taken a very, it would have been very careful to, about crossing him. But at the same time, he's someone, because of his emphasis on tact and private criticism as opposed to public criticism, I think, uh, in fact, that was very much the kind of person that they were interested in cultivating. Mm. Right? They might find out what people didn't like locally, but they would be told privately, not publicly, in an embarrassing sort of way. So I think that in, in that sense, he's someone who, just the, he's just the kind of Adam that a governor might appreciate. Mm. Right? Um, but it's also very clear that he saw that local authorities were the ones that counted. The, the final point actually I wanted to make, and I, you know, now remember, was, when I, was to go back to this whole circle of justice question which is that for uh, Shahrani, he never suggests that the Sultan will intervene to prevent problems. He, he rather suggests that actually it's the Sufi Sheikh who's the person who intervenes. So it's the assumption that local religious officials are the ones who actually have the ability to intervene, whether spiritually or through political uh, intervention. Uh, so I, I think for him, the Ottoman authorities in some ways in Istanbul were far off and his arrangement were with local authorities, and that's, that's the world in which he, uh, he functioned. One thing I should also mention in that context is that if you look at the manuscripts that survive of the work, although there are hundreds and hundreds of manuscripts of Shahrani's works in Istanbul, I think about 600 or so, uh, well more, I think, than there actually are in, in, in Egypt, there, none of the political works exist there. Uh -huh. The copies we have were, uh, well, one, ones that we have easy, easy access to were Egypt, maybe Syria, uh, Tunis, and there's supposed to be copies also in, in, in Yemen. So the Arab provinces, perhaps, of the Ottoman Empire. But Istanbul, that, those books weren't, weren't read, okay. which is probably not a coincidence. Uh, Dr. Omaima. Thank you for a very interesting uh, lecture. My question is the Okay, the debate or the main issue is that equivocal relationship between spiritual and worldly authority or spiritual and political authority, the Sheikh and the Amir. Where do the fuqaha come in? Yani the, is, I don't, I'm not familiar with the Shahrani's work. Any mention of the fuqaha that another type of authority, legal authority? And there also, if he mentions those people. Right. Yes, they come, they come in in two different ways. Uh, in, his law, in his law books, he condemns them quite often, actually. Although he says that all of the, the Madahib are legitimate, they all come from the same source, the learning comes from the same source. Uh, he condemns them basically for their uh, arguments about law, that this is, in a sense, has made law inaccessible to ordinary people, mm. uh, and that it's really, it's primarily about their own self promotion rather than about anything spiritual. And of course, this is an idea also present in Ibn Arabi's uh, work as well. So in that sense, he condemns them very much. And in fact, he'll talk about how the ordinary artisan who wants to simply get a simple answer to what is, what is lawful, what isn't lawful from a religious point of view, can't get a straight answer because he goes to two different authorities and gets two different answers. So he, he regards this as, as, as a catastrophe. So in that sense, he's very uh, negative about the fuqaha. On the other hand, you know, there's always this problem of is there an opposition between fiqh and tasawwuf? in a general sort of way. And he says, no, actually fiqh is, you know, Stusawa basically is fiqh in action. That's in a sense is the notion of the, the, the active scholars, that, that the, the real Sufis are the ones who act in accordance with the law, but who have a, a spiritual dimension to it. So in that sense, he's not rejecting law, he's simply saying that, he's in some ways suggesting that the Sufis are perhaps better interpreters of it, mm. in some ways. And of course, by this time, many, many fuqaha are also Sufis. Yes. 
Yeah, it's very common to combine the two. This uh, might be a slightly selfish question, but I am very interested in Mecca and Medina. Okay. And I would have thought, you know, that it would be mentioned in a lecture. I'm not criticizing your lecture, obviously, which is extremely interesting, but I've noticed it doesn't mention Mecca or Medina or the Sharifs of Mecca, who I would have thought would be very important people as claiming descent and probably being authentic descendants and presiding over the Hajj. Could you comment on, on that kind of apparent marginalization of them, which you find so often? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Sure, happy to do that. Um, Ashanarani does talk a lot about the Hajj and whom he met on the Hajj, but mostly he talks about fellow Sufis he met on the Hajj. So that's his, his principal interest in the subject. Now, if you looked at last, uh, that's my last previous lecture, I talked about the Bakri family right, in, in Egypt, who also had very close relations uh, in Mecca and Medina. In fact, they had a house uh, just outside the Haram in, in Mecca. Right? And they had close relations with the Ashraf, in fact. So I think, in fact, some of the ulama families uh, in Cairo did have very close relations with the Ashraf uh, and clearly accepted their authority. There were, there were correspondence between them. Uh, the Bakris, for example, received money from the Sora, you know, the, the, the purse, uh, the Ottoman purse, which went, to, which went first to the, the Ashraf, but the Ashraf then could choose people to receive portions of it. So I think, in fact, there are quite close relations. It just doesn't seem to be as important to work, for, important an issue for Shah Rani per se, as an individual. But for other Sufi families, I think you would find that relationship was very close. I'm not sure that answers your question, but. Other questions? Uh, Anthony at the back. Uh, I'm kind of curious if you could, uh, if we move back a little bit and look at the, the period as a whole and this formation of uh, Ottoman state building and the Ottoman states forming in a way that is, is rather um, unique in comparison to its predecessors in the Islamic world, but also matches the kind of state building that we see going on with the Habsburg Empire and the, and the other states of Europe and then the other gunpowder empires of the Mughals and the Safavids. And also this idea that now there's a need um, to have a mechanism or this, this idea that as part of the state administering the realms or as part of the state administering the, 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 it, its responsibilities, you have this development of kanun and this idea of, uh, of a more temporal legal system that kind of runs parallel with the Sharia. And while you're talking about Sufism, we also see this dichotomy between a temporal and, uh, and, and, and a spiritual uh, leader. So it seems like there's many currents uh, in different areas, whether it's the Ottomans or the Sufis, et cetera, during the same time period where you're seeing this dichotomy between these two issues. And I know you addressed that a little bit, but I don't, could you go into any more detail about this dichotomy between spiritual and temporal and the other intellectual currents during that time period that may reflect that or that might go against that same current? Sure. Uh, as you probably know, the, I mean, the book on this subject is Cornel Fleischer's book on Mustafa Ali, right? uh, in which he shows that uh, after Suleiman's death, that there's a considerable revolt among many Ottoman uh, bureaucrats and chroniclers against the concept of kanun. This doesn't seem to have stopped the Ottoman sultans from issuing more kanuns uh, or prevented it from functioning but they do begin to interpret the failure of the empire to continue growing through conquest uh, and uh, a number of setbacks as being the result of what they saw as a kind of secularization or of a, at least a failure to apply Sharia. Now, this of course is, a, uh, is something of a uh, false memory because at no point was the Ottoman Empire purely based on Sharia. Right? Certainly going back as far as Mehmed II, there are substantial use of Kanun and even earlier than that, I think you can argue that, that, that Kanun is, is in play in different ways as well. Um, and as you pointed out, the Ottoman state, the early Ottoman state is heavily, in fact, influenced, most people would say, by the Byzantines. Um, later, by the Mamluk Sultanate, after the conquest of, e of Egypt and Syria. So, uh, this whole discourse, I mean, partly it's about a kind of uh, imagined past, an idealized past, in which the, a, rule, a sort of just rule and a successful rule is founded on Sharia, 
And so the perceived decline, which again is, a, I mean, this is a loaded concept, but it's used by Ottoman chroniclers to describe the failure to grow it's at the same rate, is seen as a result of this turning away from Sharia. Uh, I don't think in the case of uh, Asharani we see so much, he's not concerned so much with this question of the health of the empire, perhaps because he lives at a time which Suleiman is still, is still ruling and the empire is still growing. For him it's more a religious question of whether Kanun is legitimate or one might be cynical and say how might we legitimate it when we know it isn't. Uh, and the answer for him is that it's, it belongs to a time in which the world, uh, religion is in decline in the world. And this is inevitable, it's part of God's plan. So by, by extension, the rise of secular law, which contradicts Sharia, is also part of God's plan. But in a sort of perverse kind of way. Uh, so I don't, does, that, does that answer your question or were there other aspects you wanted to raise? Any other questions? No? Okay, thank you very much everybody and thank you Dr. Sabra again for your visit and for your lecture.